أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين به ونتوكل عليه والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن يطع الله والرسول فأولئك مع الذين أنعم الله عليهم من النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وحسن أولئك رفيقا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم For the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, the acceptance of the deeds and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف Enlighten your souls, purify your hearts with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad اللهم صلي على محمد wa Ali Muhammad Respected scholars, elders, sisters and brothers, Salaamun Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi Ta'ala wa Barakatuh. Lady Amina bint Wahab was the mother of the greatest human being and the best of God's creation, Al-Rasul Al-A'zam wa Nabi Al-Akram, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sallam. And an individual that perhaps many Muslims have at least come to her, her name. In other words, she's not alien to many people, yet unfortunately her life has not been discussed and has not been placed before many people to admire her legacy and her excellence. Without a shadow of a doubt, Amina bint Wahab is one of the most outstanding females in Islamic history. I tell you, when you and I are taught from a young age to respect parents, to understand the status of parents in Islam, where Allah wa ta'ala says, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَن لَا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانَ Be righteous towards your parents, honor your parents. What about the parents of the best of God's creation? In other words, how should you and I look at and admire the mother and the father of the individual that the Holy Quran says has what? Has authority over ourselves and over our family members and everything that we have. In other words, the status of Amina and Abdullah, the parents of the Holy Prophet of Islam, is without a shadow of a doubt something that many of us would have no hesitation to honor. Yet, hundreds of millions of Muslims today believe they are kafir. Unfortunately, the recognition that emerges today is when it comes to Amina, when it comes to Abdullah, the illustrious, honorable, pure parents of the Messenger of God, there is a sizable number of Muslims throughout history and until today who come forward categorically declaring that they died disbelievers. And therefore, the subject of the biography and the life of Amina is of the utmost importance. Number one, to honor her and to honor the Messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon him, and his holy progeny, but at the same time to recognize what a special status she had in order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to choose her to carry and to be the womb indeed that brings into this existence as far as the dunya is concerned, the holy prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and his holy progeny. Amina salamullahi alayha only lived for 30 years. When she died, she was 30 years of age. According to narrations, she was born 76 years before the hijrah of the messenger of God. And she died 46 years 
before the Hijrah. Her family originally were from Medina, Yathrib. She was from the Bani Najjar tribe. Yet, of course, she is considered to be from Quraysh. She was an individual from the tribe of Quraysh. Quraysh attained its name from an incident at the time of the grandfather of Amina by the name of Qusay ibn Kilam. Qusay was a grandfather of Amina. How? He was the grandfather from her father's side, Wahab. Qusay was the one who is attributed to have brought Quraysh back together. In other words, they were dispersed and Qusay was the individual who gathered them, brought them all together in Makkatul Mukarrama. What is interesting is that Qusay had what? Qusay had a brother by the name of Zahra. Yes, this Zahra was what? Was the grandfather of whom Wahab. Whereas Qusay was the grandfather of the Prophet of Islam. In other words, you find that Abdullah, the husband of Amina, as well as Amina herself, all link back to whom? All link back to the same grandfather. When it came to the upbringing of Amina, Amina was brought up in a household which was practicing Tawheed, monotheism, worshipping Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. This is established in historical narrations. In the idea that she was known for her purity, for her chastity, in Mecca al Mukarrama, she was recognized as an individual from a household of nobility. They would worship Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. This is something that, of course, today the school of Ahl al Bayt stands to defend. Abdul Muttalib, Abu Talib, Hashim, when it comes to Abdullah, when it comes to Amina, Fatiba bint Asad. These great individuals never bowed down to an idol. These great individuals were people who worshipped Allah despite a time of jahiliya, backwardness, despite people worshipping idols in Mecca and in the Arabian Peninsula. In fact, the Messenger of God, the Rasul al-A'zam, one Nabi al-Akram, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Highlights this reality. Some people may question, do we need to prove this and go through evidence highlighting that Amina salamullahi alayha was a muwahida, that she worshipped Allah and Allah alone? Yes, because sadly the realization is Muslims today differ in this regard. They have difference of opinion whether Amina should be honored, whether Amina should be what? Should be praised. I remember watching a clip on a TV channel known as Huda TV. I deliberately mentioned the name so that you recognize and be aware. A particular Sheikh in this Huda TV, he was asked about, for example, Abu Talib. He was asked about Abdullah. He was asked about Amina. What is the opinion of the Muslim schools of thought regarding these individuals? I saw him reply in that particular clip. He said, I pray to Allah that they are in hell. I pray that they are in hell. Yes. The recognition, therefore, is that the Messenger of God in Amali of Sheikh Tusi or Saduq, he mentions the following. There is a narration from the sixth Imam that says the Messenger of God said, was asked, Where were you? Aina kunta wa Adamu fil Jannah. When Adam was first created, where were you? The Prophet responds, Kuntu fi sulbih. I was in his loins. And when Adam descended on the earth, I descended with him in his loins. And I also ascended the ship of my father Nuh with him. When Ibrahim was thrown towards the fire, I was also with him in his loins. And then he continues and says, وَلَمْ يَزِلِ اللَّهِ يَنْقُلُنِي مِنَ الْأَصْلَابِ الطَّيِّبَةِ إِلَى الْأَرْحَامِ الْمُطَحَّرَةِ And therefore, subsequently, God the Almighty me passed me from pure loins and pure wombs from one individual to another. هَادِيًا مَحْدِيًّا Guided, guiding others. Then he comes towards the end of the narration and says, Shukkali isman min asma'ihi al husna until he subhanahu wa ta'ala chose a name for me that is derived from his glorious names. Fadul Arshi Mahmudun wa ana Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his name is Mahmud, and I was given the name Muhammad. Therefore, the recognition is that this lady was indeed of the noble character, worshipped the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, back in Medina, uh, in Mecca, what do you find? In Mecca, you find that Abdullah was an individual who was the son of Abdul Muttalib. Rudwanullahi ta'ala alayhim ajma'in. When it came to Abdullah, the narrations tell us that in Mecca, he was known as the man with the light in his face. The individual that had radiating light in his face to the extent that many women would seek him for marriage. Many wanted to get married to him, yes? We are told in narrations, Allama Majlisi in Bihar tells us this very interesting story regarding how Amina Salamullahi Alaiha married Abdullah. Please pay attention to this. It may be the first time you hear this. The story is told that there are some of the script writers, Ahbar of the Jews. They were in Sham. When they were in Sham, they came to one of their leaders, one of their scholars, said, we are disturbed. We are reading that the time of the arrival of the individual who will lead mankind and will be the final messenger has come. And we are told there is an individual in Mecca who is claiming to be that person. What do we do? We need to stop him because he has to be from us, not the Arabs. The scholar told them when God the Almighty decrees, you cannot change anything. You cannot alter with this. You cannot play with this. This is determined. They left the gathering. They saw another one of the rabbis. That individual said to them, you are actually able to change this. Go to Mecca and stop this particular child from being born. Stop him from coming into this existence. They went to Mecca, disguised as tradesmen. When they arrived in Mecca, they were searching for the father of the Prophet. They were looking for a man who had the hallmarks as described in their scriptures to be the father of the last and the final messenger. In the meantime, Abdullah Salamullah alayhi, the father of the Holy Prophet, saw a dream. The dream disturbed him. He went to Abdul Muttalib Salamullah alayhi, his father. He said to him, Father, I saw a dream that disturbed me. Abdul Muttalib said, Tell me what's the dream? He said, once I was walking in the desert and all of a sudden I saw monkeys with swords seeking to attack me, seeking to kill me. All of a sudden I saw a thunder strike, a what? Some kind of punishment that fell from the skies towards them and it killed them all. What is the interpretation of this dream? Abdul Muttalib said to him, just wait. When this dream was told to Abdul Muttalib, he told his son, Abdullah, let's go and tell the people of Mecca about this dream. So when they left where they were, the house of Abdul Muttalib, the first area that they went to is where these Ahbar, these scripture writers from the Jews were gathered. Abdul Muttalib begins to narrate the dream of his son, Abdullah. Those individuals, now they see Abdullah for the first time. They see he must be the father of the final messenger. Therefore, they plot to kill him. They said, how are we going to kill him? They asked one of their slaves to follow him, to follow Abdullah. And Abdullah had a habit. He would go out hunting. He would seek some wildlife in the deserts. One day, the slave came and said to these individuals, this is your moment. He is alone. You can go and kill him and achieve what you wish to achieve. They got themselves ready. They went to the deserts. They followed Abdullah until they found him to be in one particular spot. He had captured an animal. He had slaughtered a particular animal. They began to approach him. Abdullah looked at them and began to ask them, who are you? What are you seeking to do? They began to run towards Abdullah with their swords. Abdullah who was on a horse was what? Was an excellent archer. He began to shoot them with arrows, killing a number of them. They realized that by the time they get to him, all of them will be killed. They stopped and called him, Oh, Abdullah, why are you killing us? We are not here to hurt you. Abdullah dismounted from his horse. He came towards them and said, What is your story? They said, We lost a slave of ours. 
And we thought you were that slave. We, we thought that we have found you here. You have already killed a number of us. Please do not harm, harm us. We are not here to hurt you. Abdullah was suspicion of them. Yet, he began to walk away from them. The moment they began to walk away, after a bit of a distance, they what? Behind him began to run. They were determined to kill the father of the messenger of God. Because they knew he had not yet got married. The moment they surrounded him, Abdullah began to fight them. But who emerged at that moment? A number of individuals from Quraysh. A number of people from Quraysh emerged, including Abdul Muttalib. Including whom? Including Wahab. Yes? Wahab, Abdul Muttalib, and others would come to the help and aid of Abdullah. And they would save him from this particular what, ambush and attempt to assassinate him. When Wahab, who is the father of Amina, went back to his house, he had a discussion with his wife. His wife, his, her name was Barra. He said to her, oh Barra, this man Abdullah is from a noble family. He's from a very respected, honorable in the, uh, family. I wish that we can marry our daughter Amina to him. Barra said, everyone is seeking Abdullah. He is the man with light radiating from his face. Do we stand a chance? Can we really be individuals who grant our daughter Amina towards this man? Wahab said, why don't you go to the house of Abdul Muttalib and see if this is possible? Barra takes the journey, goes to the house of Abdul Muttalib. He finds Abdul Muttalib outside the house talking to a few men, describing what has just happened. The saving of the life of whom? Of Abdullah. She stands there, Abdul Muttalib greets her and says to her, we would like to thank you and your husband for joining us and saving the life of Abdullah. Is there anything we can do for you? Barra thinks this is a great moment to ask for Abdullah to marry my daughter. She says, oh Abdul Muttalib, you are an, an, an esteemed individual. Your family is what? Is very much revered and respected. We wish that our daughter Amina would marry your son Abdullah. Abdullah at that moment did not dismiss the idea. He did not say this is impossible, this could not happen. Who is standing close to him? His son Abdullah. Abdul Muttalib looks at Abdullah and what? And asks him. He says to him, Ma taqulu ya bunay? The father asks the son, What do you say, O oh my son? For Allah, listen to this. This is now a description of Amina in the words of the grandfather of the Messenger of God. He says, For Allah, ma fi banati Makkata mithliha. Wallah, there is no girl female in Mecca like her. Li'annaha muhtashimatun fi nafsiha. She is chaste. Tahiratun mutahara. She is pure and has been purified. Aqilatun dayyina. She is intelligent. And she practices her faith. Abdullah became silent. When Abdul Muttalib said to him this, Abdullah did not respond. Abdul Muttalib recognized that his silence means acceptance. And immediately said to Barra, we have accepted your invitation and your request. This was the beginning of the agreement of the marriage. Yes that would, it would certainly bring forth, as a result, the greatest human being. The first area to look at very briefly, as far as the contemporary lessons, many a times when we speak about the biography of Sayyida Khadija, what do we tell? We are told that she was the one who sought the Prophet. Do you agree? Many a times we are told that she said to her slave, go and ask for the hand of the Prophet. And that Khadija was the one who asked first, yes? Similarly, when it came to the mother of the Prophet, she was the one who requested. She, her family, was the one who actually asked for the hand of the Prophet 1400 years ago or more. Today, this is difficult for some people. Back in the time, it was even harder. The way they viewed females, the way society would what? Would work, would not accept the notion of a female asking the hand of a male. Yet the Prophet of Islam, both his mother 
and his wife are involved in this practice. And today we have a problem. Today we are also hesitant to allow our daughters or our wives or our mothers to go and request and ask whether an individual is seeking to get married and whether they want to get married to their own daughter. In many communities, many cultures, many societies, you speak to them, you say, for example, your daughter is in the 30s. She's seeking to get married. She's waiting for somebody to propose to her. Why don't you become active? Why don't you yourself seek particular individuals, yes, who are matching your criteria or her requirements? Why is it that we are in the mindset that females must wait for a male to approach and what and ask for her hand why couldn't she or her family be proactive in seeking someone for their marriage they are fulfilling what an obligation they are securing half of their faith this requires time but interestingly was something that happened what at the time of the messenger of god for the messenger's mother and father himself and of course the celebration and the wedding was a momentous occasion in mecca al mukarrama narrations tell us that abdul muttalib salamullahi alayhi would hold a feast for four days he would wear the best of clothes he gave a famous sermon time does not allow us to go through this particular sermon where he would indeed praise the families and would say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had honored this particular marriage. Likewise, what are we told? Fatima, his wife. Fatima is who? Is the wife of Abdul Muttalib. Yes? The grandmother of the Prophet of Islam. Fatima goes to see Amina just to, you know, prepare everything for the marriage. When she comes back, she says to Abdullah the following, Ya waladi, ma fi banat al-Arabi mithduha abada. I have not seen in the daughters of the Arabs anyone like her. Wa laqad irtadaytuha, wa inna Allah la yuwadda'u hadha al-nur illa fi mithli hadha. I am so pleased with her. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not place the light that is within you except within her. Notice, these individuals, they knew. They had recognition. They had ma'rifah and knowledge of what is about to happen out of this blessed relationship between Amina and Abdullah. Salamullahi alayhim ajma'een. Now, when they get married, what happens? According to my study of the historical years that followed the marriage, it seems likely that they only lived together for about a year or two. Abdullah's marriage with his beloved wife Amina only lasted for a year or two. Why? Because Abdullah would go on the journey that Quraysh would undertake. Yes? They would go during the summer and during the winter. He would go towards Sham. On his way, he went to Yathrib. He would constantly go to Yathrib. Yes? He fell ill in Yathrib and he sadly passed away. Where? in Yathrib, modern day Madinatul Munawwara. The Prophet of Islam had not yet been born. According to many historians, the Prophet of Islam was what? Not yet born. Yet Amina was of course pregnant with the Messenger of God. And this, without a shadow of a doubt, was something that placed grief and sadness in her heart. And in day, indeed, we find narrations that Abdul Muttalib himself was very much saddened by this. The narrations tell us, therefore, that Amina salamullahi alayha would give birth to the Holy Prophet al-Rasul al-A'zam wa nabi al-Akram Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And this happened in the morning Fajr time of Friday, the 17th of Rabi'ah al-Awwal in the year known as the year of the elephant. Without going into the description of the details of what happened during that illustrious birth, that moment that the heavens indeed would shine with light, that the idols would fall and break, that the fire of the Zoroastrians and those worshipping other than Allah will be extinguished. We are told that this honorable lady would what? Would bring forth the messenger of God. When he would, when she would bring forth the messenger of God, she would breastfeed him according to some narrations for two days. Other narrations I found four days, maximum nine days. Maximum nine days. Now, 
Many of the stories that you have on the member regarding what happened next may be subject to fabrication. Please pay attention to this because the tarikh, the history, the Sira Nabawiya is what? Is unfortunately one that did not become saved from the hands of Bani Umayyah and Bani Al Abbas when it comes to distortions. One of the likely distortions in the story of the Prophet of Islam from the first days of his birth is the story of Halima Sa'di, Radwanullahi Ta'ala Alayha. What do we mean? We are told that Halima, this righteous woman, she came to where she came to Mecca seeking work she was a wet nurse she wanted to feed someone when the narration tells us she wanted to feed someone the only person that was left was the baby who was known as Muhammad but she was hesitant the narration says because what because the family was poor she would, they would not have money yes and therefore others were taken and the only one who was left was the Prophet and therefore she would accept the Prophet this is likely to be a false story, a false narration. Why? Abdul Muttalib, Abu Talib, the, uh, the tribe of Bani Hashim were well off. They were what? Well established in Mecca. They were not individuals who were destitute and poor. Number one. Number two, the decision to make Halima the wet nurse of the Prophet was not a decision of Halima. And it was not a decision of Abdul Muttalib, neither was a decision of Amina. It was a decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was all planned. Yes, you say to me, where is the proof? This is a narration that we have in a number of our books. Yes, Halima comes to Mecca. She sees Abdul Muttalib solving the problems of the people. She looks at him and says, I want to suckle a baby. Yes, but I specifically want to take your grandson, Muhammad. He said to her, if he comes to you, then yes. Only if he accepts you. She goes to Amina. She says to Amina, فَقَالَتْ إِسْمِي حَلِيمَ My name is Halima. فَقَالَتْ آمِنَ نَعَمْ Yes, listen to this. أَنْتِ مَنْ أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أُسَلِّمَ وَلَدِي لَهَا You are the one I was commanded to give my son to. Not everything you hear from the member and you read in books of history regarding the seerah of al-Nabawi, you take to be what actually happened. Be very careful, yes? Because sometimes, yes, these narrations are taken as established or the stories people are quite confident with their authenticity. But more investigation is actually required. And thereafter, Amina would hand over the Prophet of Islam to Halima. And Halima would say, I don't want any payment. Amin it says, but we have to honor you. Abdul Muttalib showers her with gifts, yes, and renumerates her. Halima asks Amina, how has been the first few days and how was your pregnancy? Listen to the words of Amina. Amina said, when I was pregnant with this child, during the darkness of the night, I do not, did not need any candles or any light. Wherever I went, the path would illuminate for me. And she would describe the beautiful what story of the birth of the Holy Prophet of Islam. Now this particular lady, Halima, would take the Prophet. Some narration says two years, maximum four years. Why? Some people say why? Number one, because the dialect in Mecca was something that sometimes was adulterated or distorted, the Arabic dialect, due to the presence of tribes who would come from different parts of the world to, in order to trade. And therefore, it was common practice for children to be raised where outside Mecca um, would be raised in areas which were less cosmopolitan, less populated. That's particularly one reason. Another is the purer air that existed outside Mecca. And a third that it was common. It was something that everybody did, would raise the children outside the main city. But the main reason was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this to happen. And without a shadow of a doubt, without going into reasons or evidence, we believe Hamida as Sa'di, Allah ta'ala alayha, whose grave today still exists and is marked what or mu'mineen are able to find it although it's unmarked in Jannatul Baqiya and Madinatul Munawwara was monotheistic she never worshipped any other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because she would breastfeed the messenger of God and she would raise the prophet of Islam in such an honorable wonderful way she herself would see a number of miracles narrations tell us that she witnessed a number of miracles she was not able to suckle the prophet from her left side the moment she obtained the prophet she would had milk from her left side 
She herself says that there was a tree, a palm tree, that I would constantly go and pluck some dates to give to some children. One day, what I would normally do is pluck some dates and when the young Muhammad would be asleep, I would wake, when he would wake up, I would give him these dates. Yes? But one day I'd forgotten to give him the dates. Instead, I gave it to the other children. When he woke up, he was hungry. I saw him with my own eyes. He walked towards that palm tree and spoke to it and said, Oh, palm tree, I ask you by my status in the eyes of Allah to kneel down. And the palm tree knelt down. The prophet plucked some dates from it and it went back up again. She said, I saw these particular miracles and I recognized that this child was not a normal child. He was certainly destined to become an individual who is great. When she handed over the Prophet to Amina at the age of four, the Messenger of God was back with his own mother. What was it that Amina alayha, would do on an annual basis? She would go and visit the grave of her husband in Yathrib. There is a grave for Abdullah Salamullah in an area known as Darun Nabigha. Darun Nabigha is where they buried Abdullah. Amina would take the Prophet, would make the journey from Mecca to Medina, or Yathrib at that time, and would pay her respects to her husband. Every single year, she would go and what? And would uh, visit this particular grave. And the narrations tell us the Prophet of Islam in one instance spent one month in that house next to the grave of his own father, Abdullah. When the Prophet was six years of age, when Amina left the grave of her husband, beloved husband, Abdullah, on his, her way back to Mecca, 23 miles approximately outside Medina, she fell ill and she passed away. Narrations tell us that she left this world at the age of 30. What is interesting is, till today, her grave can be found in an area known as Abwa. Please pay attention to this. Not many people go to visit the mother of Amina. Who was it that established the ziyara of the grave of Amina, sallallahu alayha? It was none other than the Prophet of Islam, Rasul al-A'bam Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Because narrations tell us from the Hajjatul <coughs> Wada. When the Prophet of Islam performed the final pilgrimage on his way back to Medina, he went to the grave. He sat next to the grave. <coughs> and he would then say words that would make everybody cry. Fabaka wa abka. The narration is found in Mustadrak al Sahihain. Al Hakim al Nishapuri says it is Sahih this narration, as well as a number of other historians and narrators of hadith. They all come forward and say that the Prophet performed ziyara of the grave of his beloved mother, Amina. And what did he recite, I wonder, that made others cry? Because today when we recite Masaib, there are Muslims who say, where did you come from? How is this allowed in Islam? I ask them, the Prophet, when he was next to the grave of his own beloved mother, what did he recite that made others cry? It's just to create the emotion in order for people to be able to connect to that particular individual. Now, an important subject that we must end with is this idea that exists today. In the Muslim world, our brothers from the Ahl sunnah fall into three categories when it comes to Amina and Abdullah. Please pay attention to this so that you understand where we stand and how the Muslims view the fathers and the mothers of the Ma'sumin. Peace and blessings be upon them. The first group of our brothers from other Muslim schools of thought say they are believers. And the reason why they say they are believers is they have a narration that says the Prophet of Islam went to the grave of Amina and went to the grave of Abdullah and asked Allah to bring them back to life again. They were brought back to life and they both testify to the oneness of Allah and the messengership of the Prophet of Islam. So they say that they both died as believers. However, a good number, a good means sizable number of Muslims headed by the likes of, for example, Allama Hafid, for example, individuals like Fakhruddin al-Razi, Ibn Taymiyyah and others, they believe that they are definitely kafir. 
that they died as disbelievers. You ask me, what is the evidence that they have? They have two hadiths in Sahih, Muslim, and Bukhari. Yes? One of the hadiths in the Sahih literature says that when the Prophet of Islam saw an individual who asked him, Ya Rasulullah, is my father in hell? The Prophet said, yes. The man was upset, so he walked away. The Prophet called him back and says, don't worry, my father is also in hell. Another narration, yes, in Sahih Muslim says, in one occasion, the Prophet of Islam came forward and said what? He said, I asked Allah, oh Allah, allow me to seek forgiveness for my mother. He did not allow me. He said to me, I asked him, Ya Allah, at least let me visit her grave. He allowed me. This is where in Sahih Muslim. How do we respond to this? Very briefly. If you look at the first narration, there is an important individual you must know. The narrator of this particular hadith, his name is Hamad ibn Salama. Hamad ibn Salama narrates that the Prophet of Islam said, my father is in hell. Hamad ibn Salama was what? An individual who married a female, a lady, who already had a son. Her son was Ibn Abi Awja. If those who know the biography of the sixth Imam, Imam Sadiq salam, will not be alien to the name Ibn Abi Awja. Ibn Abi Awja was one of the Zanadiqa. Ibn Abi Awja, Awja was a mulhid. He was an atheist. Now what happened later on, this particular individual, Hamad, who is a narrator of hadith, widely utilized in the Sahih literature, would forget the narrations. And therefore, he would give the books of hadith to this adopted son of his. Whom? Ibn Abi Awja. Ibn Abi Awja was later convicted of what? Of being a atheist by the Bani Abbas. Abbasin said, we have to kill you. When he was about to be killed for this, he came forward and said, this is recorded in Muslim literature. He said, I have fabricated 4,000 narrations and I've made halal what is haram and I've made haram what is halal. So the source of this fabrication is an individual who was himself what? An atheist. Similarly, if you look at the second narration, what is the problem with the second narration? They say that the Prophet said, Ya Allah, I want to do istighfar for my mother. But Allah says, no. But the Quran comes forward and does not allow the what? The visiting of the, to the graves of the mushrikeen. In chapter 9, verse 113, Allah says, Ma kala lil nabi wal ladheena amanu an yastaghfiru Yes, lil mushrikeen, that they cannot do istighfar for the mushrikeen. Well, and then later Allah says in another verse, Wala taqum ala qabre. Do not go and visit the graves of mushrikeen. How is it then that the Prophet would go and visit the grave of his own mother if she was a mushrik, God forbid? But I leave you with an outstanding narration which points to the fact that these honorable individuals were indeed monotheistic, were honorable, they are role models and exemplary. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. This narration is beautiful, listen to it. Inna Allah awha ila nabi Allah revealed to the Holy Prophet, inni harramtu nara ala sulbin anzalak. I have made hell haram forbidden for the loin that brought you into existence and the womb that carried you and the what and the individual who looked after you and a family that what protected you who are these the loin that brought you is abu is abdullah the womb that carried you is amina the individual who looked after you is abu talib and the family that protected you is Fatima bint Asad. Yes. Rudwanullahi ta'ala alayhim. This narration and much more highlights their nobility, their excellence, the fact that were indeed believers from day one and that the Prophet of Islam loved them and indeed prayed for them. Finally, the spiritual tip for today is the following. That many a times in the month of Ramadan we are told recite this dua, recite this dua. We are indeed presented with so many beautiful supplications in the month of Ramadan. It's the month of du'as without a shadow of a doubt. But what we need to get out of is what I call the robotic tick zone. 
RTZ, yes, robotic tick zone, which means what? Which means we have a sense that I must recite a number of du'as every day just so that I have recited them. No problem. Recite them. It's great. There is benefit. But there are those who say, which du'a should we focus more in the month of Ramadan? The answer is the du'a that you understand and connect with the most. The du'a that you feel what your heart tending softer the most. The du'a that indeed makes you aware and cognizant of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Recite that du'a frequently during the month of Ramadan and especially when it comes to the nights of Qadr. Finally, the fiqhi mas'ala. Some mu'mineen have said our lips are dry in the month of Ramadan. Are we allowed to use this lip balm? Yes, that, uh, that is used to uh, somehow moisten the lips. There is no problem. As long as we are not using the tongue to take any of this away and indeed swallow it or ingest it. There is no problem there. To toothbrush and brushing the teeth in the month of Ramadan, is that something that is permissible or not? It is permissible provided we can be sure that we do not swallow the toothpaste or the water used during the process, that we must make sure that everything is what is taken out. What about the final mas'ala? And that is intravenous fluids. Injections are allowed. Yes, there is no problem in having injection. For example, if you have not yet had the COVID vaccine, please have the COVID vaccine. Yes, even when you're fasting, there is no problem in doing so. But what about if somebody is healthy and totally fine, goes to the hospital and says, I want IV fluid, please, because I feel weak. Is this allowed? What do you think? Yes? No? Most people are happy that it's a no, it's allowed. Don't all of you rush to hospital, please. Yes, it's allowed because what is forbidden is what is ingested, what is taken in the mouth. Yet if you have IV fluid, it does not break your fast. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our fast and grant us success in dunya and akhirah and allow us to follow in the footsteps of the great ladies in Islam especially Amina bint Wahab with the barakah of salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.